Hey guys, back. 383 stroker build. I know this is long awaited. Uh, today we're going to talk about the camshaft installation, the cam that we chose. We did decide to go with a roller cam. I uh, fortunately was able to convince the, the customer to go with a roller cam as opposed to a flat tappet cam. It was quite a bit more money, but uh, if, if you know anything about camshafts, I don't have to tell you that going with a roller cam is far better than a flat tappet cam, especially with the new uh, types of cams that are out there today. So uh, we don't have to worry about cam break-in or using any kind of high zinc oil or anything like that. So we did get the kit, so here we go. Uh, uh, without delay, I'm going to walk you through how to install and degree this camshaft. We want to degree it to make sure that we don't have any any issues with the cam, make sure that the cam is what it's supposed to be and that it matches the cam card. So here we go. So this is our brand new camshaft that we just ordered. So we want to... They sent it in this nice little handy carrier. I like this thing. I'm going to hang on to this in case I need to... So what you want to do is you want to get your cam out and visually inspect it. Most cam manufacturers are pretty good at quality control, but you want to make sure that there's no obvious defects or anything of that nature. Choosing a camshaft, now this is a small base circle cam. If you take a look at this cam, uh, a lot of the higher lift cams are small base circle, but if you compare this to uh, just a stock type camshaft, you'll notice that the base circle of this lobe is its almost right down to the billet of the cam. So this is this is what you would call a, a small base circle cam, and it is a hydraulic roller. And this one looks really good. We're going to get our cam card out. Now the, the camshaft is going to come with a cam card. And also on the, on the roller cams, of course, we have, this is what they call a retrofit kit. Now a retrofit kit is going to come with the, the new roller lifters, obviously. And the roller lifters, most of the retrofit kits for the small block Chevrolets and the big blocks for that matter, are going to have this bar attaching the two lifters together. What that bar does is it holds those rollers in line with the cam. We can't have this lifter, the lifter body rotating in here. That would really, that would cause a real problem. So the lifters come in pairs with this bar that's riveted on holding them together. And this is a hydraulic lifter setup. So we've got a set of our cam, our set of hydraulic lifters. We also ordered what we call a thrust button. The thrust button is actually a little button that's going to go on the front of the cam. And this, this is going to go up here. And it's going to locate right on the, the front of the cam like this. And it's a little spring-loaded button. And the reason we have that in there is because the... Uh, the Chevrolet small blocks, the older ones anyway, they don't have a retaining plate on the front. So with, with, the, with the other types of camshafts, you have an angled lobe, and so the, the lifters actually hold the cam into the block. But with this roller type cam, uh, we have a problem since it has a roller that sits on here, and the roller just sits on a, a square lobe, like so. There's nothing keeping this cam from walking out of the block. So we put that thrust button in the front and it locates between the front of the camshaft and the timing chain cover with a little bit of preload. And you got to set that up and make sure your preload is right. But that's our, we're, ha we're very happy today. We actually got the camshaft. FedEx came bearing gifts. So um, I'm pretty sure this cam came from Tibet or something because I ordered it like six weeks ago. But it does look like a good camshaft. It's got a good hardened gear on here and so forth. So it looks like a good quality camshaft. And we have the cam card. We know what the specs are supposed to be. So let me walk you through installation. So before you put your cam in, uh, one thing, and, and uh, what we've done in between clips here is we've taken and we've, we've cleaned this cam. We cleaned it with some brake clean, a little bit of solvent, and then we finally washed it with soap and water because the manufacturer puts a coating on the camshaft. It's like a, it's like a uh, cosmoline or, or some type of a lubricant that keeps this thing from rusting. So you want to clean all that off there. So we've got our cam nice and clean. Final wash it with soap and water. And one of the things that I do 
is I take dry graphite lubricant, and you don't have to do this, but it's just something that I like to do, and I spray the cam, and it just helps give a little extra protection on those lobes during initial startup. So I will take and I will spray some dry graphite lubricant, and this stuff is really good at sticking to the lobes. So we'll get this thing coated with dry graphite, and also when you install it in the engine, we want to put some type of assembly lube. Now, the fact that this is a roller camshaft um, means that we're not really nearly concerned about uh, lubrication on these lobes as we are with a flat tappet cam. With a flat tappet cam, we're going to put lots of assembly lube, we're going to use high zinc oil and so forth. These types of camshafts, the roller cams, don't require nearly as much uh, lubrication on here. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to, we sprayed it with, with dry graphite and you want to put just a little bit of lube on these, on the mains here. I just take a little bit of assembly lube, not much, you don't need, to, you don't want a big gob of assembly lube on the main journals or the journals that actually write in the block. Just a thin coating, you just don't want these to go in on dry bearings. And again, we do have a dra graphite coating on there. So we'll get the first three, we'll put a little bit of lube on them. Uh, now the gear, this stuff here is great, you can buy it at Napa, it's called Molly Graphite Assembly Lube. It's the black stuff. I do like to put this on the distributor gear. The distributor gear is an area where there's a lot of stress and pressure and so we want to make sure that we got some really good assembly lube on that distributor gear. We don't want to skimp on that. I would normally, this Molly Graphite assembly lube, I would normally put that on all these lobes too This, if this were a flat tappet gam. Well since it's a roller and it has uh, about two-thirds less rolling resistance and two-thirds the amount of pressure between the lobe and the lifter. There's almost, there's very little uh, pressure on those lobes as far as uh, wear goes, as far as the lifter putting pressure on there and causing a problem as far as if there's no lubricant on a flat tappet, you're going you're gonna to hammer out the cam. Now these do need to be lubricated, but they don't require near the amount of lubrication because there's a lot less pressure, a lot less rolling resistance. We are going to put uh, some lube on the lifters themselves. I've already sprayed these with graphite, so there is a coating of lube on all these, all these lobes. So now you want to take your camshaft and you just want to carefully, you know, this is, I can't stress enough how careful you have to be here. I am going to kind of make this look easy because I've been doing this for 25 years. But be very careful. They do make cam handles that you can put on the cam out here to help stabilize the cam. Um, I've gotten to the point where I don't really need to do that. But just be careful. When you put a camshaft in, you never want to force it. If you're forcing the cam in, something is wrong. So this cam should slide in there with very little effort. If you get in, if you slide the cam in and you get to a point where the cam stops and it doesn't want to go in, don't force it in there. What you need to do is kind of wiggle the cam around, twist it like so until you find that cam bearing. And it's actually pretty simple. So I'm, I'm going to put some lube on these uh, journals here now because I lubed the first two. So we want to put just a dab of lube on each one of these. And also the fuel pump eccentric. This is if the customer is running a mechanical fuel pump, this lobe here in the front is for the mechanical fuel pump. So we'll just put a little bit of assembly lube on these. Not a, you don't need a, a lot. You don't want to put too much on here because you'll overwhelm the, the bearings in there. You just need a small amount just so you don't have metal to metal contact. Then we're going to very gently go in, kind of twist it and push at the same time. And you'll see that's I'm not exerting a lot of effort to get this cam in here. It's sliding in the bearings real nice. Get to, get to this one here. Now I always leave the plug out in the back of the block back here so I can kind of get in here and guide it. But if you, if you get this cam to this point, it, it's, it's okay to go ahead and twist it and, and kind of try to position it. You just don't want to force it in, okay? You see, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of finagling this thing and I'm kind of working with it to try to get it to go in. That's what we're looking for, okay? And normally we will put these in um, before we put the short block together. But the thing is, we had such a long wait for this camshaft. We actually went to a different manufacturer that we went ahead and put the motor together. 
and then we installed the cam. So at this point, I had forgotten that I did put that plug in the back, so I don't have a way to grab the cam back here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some long bolts, and I'm going to put them in the end of the camshaft here. So now that I've got these two bolts in here, you, you can kind of use the cam, use the bolts rather, as a handle. So when you get to this point, it can, it's very hard to like maneuver the cam because the back of the cam actually has to come up to go into that bearing. But if I put a couple of long bolts in here, I just very carefully go up and I can kind of push down on these bolts slightly and kind of lift the cam up and then it just slides right in. And that's cam installation. You want to make sure that the cam turns freely and this one feels really good. Of course we tested the cam bearing uh, fit, fitment before we actually assembled the engine when we were doing the cam bearing installation. Then you simply just take your the long bolts out that you use as a handle and there you go your cam is installed. So that's cam installation. Um, now that we got the cam installed we have to grab our, our timing chain. We've already got our gear pressed onto our crankshafts. So we have to grab our uh, cam gear and our chain and put it on. Now one thing I would caution you, there's three plugs right here. A lot of times when a machine shop uh, does the cleaning and vatting of the block, they will pull these three plugs out or knock them out if they're the press-in type. Before you put your cam gear on this engine, make dang sure that these plugs are in here. <laughs> because if you put your cam gear on, it actually covers up those plugs. And we're running a double roller chain, that's why the block is relieved right here, because a double roller chain will actually hit the block if you don't relieve it. But at any rate, you, you want to make sure that these plugs are installed. If you install the cam gear, it covers up those plugs. You can't really see them out of sight, out of mind. And you won't have any oil pressure when the engine starts and it'll toast the motor. I speak from experience. Many, many years ago, probably 22 years ago, I want to say, I put an engine together and I walked away and I forgot to put these plugs in and I put the cam gear on. I uh, got it in the car and it basically toasted the motor. So, you know, amateur mistake, but hey, you know, it, it was, I, was, uh, I was new in the game at that time. So, needless to say, I've never done that again. <laughs> so make sure that these gallery plugs are in before you go to put your gear on. Okay, the next step is going to be uh, gear installation, and I'm going to reposition the camera for that. So this is our <clears throat> uh, cam gear and our timing chain. Now you want to use a double roller chain. This is what they call a double roller chain and it's also what they call a pre-stretch chain. Uh, you can buy them from from Cloy's or any of the, the major manufacturers. Um, it's got a double roll of teeth and a double roll of chains and it's a roller. There's a roller uh, pin in here in between these. So it's called a double roller. Now what I like to do is there's a mark on the gear. I like to take and put a paint mark right there where that mark is so I know and I, I've also put a paint mark on the mark on here. But what we have to do, I'm going to show you a real easy way to put this gear on. What you want to do is before you put your chain on at all, you want to take and just put your gear on with a couple of bolts. So we'll take, we'll find our, our locating pin there, our dowel pin. And you don't have to really torque these bolts or anything at this point. What you want to do is just put a couple of them in and snug them down till they're finger tight. Get them so that that the gear is flush up against the cam. Run them in there so now my, I'm able to turn my cam. What you want to do is you want to take your, your mark on your cam and you want to put that mark at the 6 o'clock position. And that's going to put your pin at about 3 o'clock here. So our mark on our gear, because the way we want to time this thing is we want them to be dot to dot. So now we're going to take our crankshaft rotation socket here and I've also put a paint mark on, on the crankshaft and we're going to bring that mark around until it is at approximately 12 o'clock. And now our marks are what we call dot to dot. And you'll notice your number one cylinder at that point is at top dead center, which makes sense. Hopefully that should make sense. So now we've got them dot to dot. Now that you've got that done, you can go ahead and take this gear off and we're ready to install our chain. It's a lot easier to do it this way than it is to put the chain on and try to get this thing. I see guys fight with these all the time. They got the chain on there. It's like, yeah, that, that's really not the best way. So we got our, then you just take your chain, you hang it on your gear here. 
And again, we're gonna, we want this to be about six o'clock, so you just kind of install your chain. And what you'll notice is if you're, if you're in the right spot, you'll just fall right onto your gear there. Now it looks like we're a tooth off, so we're just gonna move, we're gonna pull this off and we're gonna move this over one tooth. And that should line us up really nicely there with our gear. Okay, so now we've gone too far the other way. We're a tooth off this way, so we need to go back this way. I want two teeth instead of one. So there we go. So now we're, we're dot to dot there. And you may be a little bit off. In other words, if, if, you, if you look at this, these are dot to dot, but that's not falling onto the pin. That's because I didn't have this at exactly six o'clock. But once you've got the chain connecting the gear here and the gear here, right? And these are at six and 12. Now, I know they're lined up. I just have to turn them so that I mesh with my pin here. So I see my pin is up a little high. So you just take and turn your engine a little bit until it slides onto the pin. Now the gears are off, but I know they're correct because I, they were correct before I moved the cam. Then you take and you put your bolts in. And once you get your bolts in, you torque them to specs and, and voila, you, you've got it. And I'll, we'll get a couple in here and then we'll verify this. So we're just gonna put these in finger tight here. And then we're just, we're gonna go back. I'm gonna go back to where these are dot to dot. And we're still lined up and you see we're dot to dot and we're good. So that's really all there is to it as far as the timing chain goes on the front of your stroker engine, small block Chevy, what have you. And of course we want to torque these up, but as long as these are dot to dot and you're at top dead center, your timing is correct, or at least it's close enough so that we can go ahead now and put our degree wheel on and go through the degreeing process of the cam. And once I get these torqued, we'll start that process. All right, so we've got our degree wheel on the front of the engine. Now it's important to understand that when you deal with camshaft specifications, um, camshaft specs, at least most of them anyway, are giving in, given in crankshaft degrees or degrees of rotation of the crankshaft. We've got a Moroso degree wheel here that we got at Powerhouse and we got a couple of indicators on the motor. We got one dial indicator on the number one piston and we've also got another dial indicator on top of the intake the number one intake lifter. Well, right now we're going to ignore that dial indicator. Um, we also have a pointer here that's set up. It's a pointer. So what the first thing you have to do is you have to find true top dead center before you ever degree a camshaft. Now let me explain what that means. There's, I have another video that explains it. I just got an old piston out of an engine we took apart here. But at top dead center, the piston actually stops for a number of degrees up here. And what can happen is the rod can be slightly over here or slightly over here and the piston's still at top dead center. True top dead center for degreeing the camshaft means that that rod is dead. It's not off this way a little bit or this way a little bit. That rod is dead center of that piston and the piston's a TDC. So there's a procedure for finding that. If you don't do that first, everything you do after that is going to be wrong. Okay. So what you do is we got our pointer here, and what we do is we put a dial indicator on our number one piston like we have there, and then we bring the engine to what we call approximate top dead center. So let's do that right now. Let me get this thing to cooperate here. So we just want to rotate the engine and watch our dial indicator until we get to the highest point of travel on our piston. Our piston's going down right there, okay? So we need to come up until our indicator starts moving and we are not in the travel of the indicator so we're going to lower that a little bit and there we go so now we're going to go back down so right now there's nothing that indicator is not touching the piston because it's down in the cylinder slightly so what we're going to do is and we'll reposition this here we're going to bring this piston up to what we call approximate de top dead center. So I'll rotate this, the piston's traveling upward, and what we do is we find the highest point of travel of that piston, which is top dead center. So now it's going backwards, it's going back down. So we'll come back up, 
Right there where it changes, that means the piston's changing direction and going the other way. So that is actually my highest point of travel. Then we just zero our indicator. And I know that my piston right now is at its highest point of travel and I got it zeroed out. Now at that point, you also want to look at your, your pointer on your degree wheel. It's because we want, see right here on the wheel it says TDC, that stands for top dead center. We want our pointer to be right at TDC while this is at true TDC. Now we're not, we don't know for sure if we're at true TDC yet, but there's a procedure for finding it. And it's actually pretty simple. So I'm just going to bend my needle. If you have to, you can reposition the degree wheel, but I've got the degree wheel set, but I'm going to bend my pointer and I'm going to put it right at, position it so it's right at top dead center, right there on zero. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to come back down off of TDC 50 thousandths on my indicator. So I'm going to go backwards counterclockwise and I'm going to come down to 50 thousandths. So counterclockwise is, is reverse rotation of the engine. So I'm going to go backwards and I'm going to watch my indicator. Now the piston's dropping down in the cylinder now. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go down to 50. I'm actually going to go past 50 right there on the indicator. And then I'm going to come right back to it. Because when you go backwards, you kind of need to do that to get the slack out of the chain if there happens to be any. So now I'm going to look at my, my wheel. So I went back down off 50 and I have just slightly over 10 degrees off of TDC. Now I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up to the top of the travel. So I'm going to bring the piston back up to zero clockwise. And I'm going to continue to go on the other side of TDC. Now the piston's dropping back down into the cylinder. And I'm going to go right to 50 this time and stop. I'm going to go right to 50 thousandths. Right there. And I'm going to look at my wheel. Now my wheel says that I have 13 degrees over here. So I actually have 13 degrees here and 10 degrees here. That means that I'm off a few degrees. What I need to find true TDC for this zero here is I have to have exactly the same number of degrees on this side as I do on this side. So I have too many degrees here and not enough here, so the needle needs to be bent that way. So if I have 10 and a half over there and I have 13 here, I probably got to go to like 11 and a half or 12 here. So I'll bend it over to we'll go to we'll go to 12 degrees and see what happens, okay? So I'm going to put that right at 12 degrees, and then I'm going to go back and do it again. And go back up to the top and I'm going to go backwards down past 50. And then I'm going to go right back to 50 and see what I got. Okay, I still have, okay, now I have 11 degrees this time. So I need a little more here because I have 12, so I need about 11 and a half on each side is what I'm looking at. So I'm going to set this for 11 and a half because that's going to take a half a thousandths or a half a degree away from the other side. So I'm positioned right at 11 and a half. And then I'm going to go back up to to top dead center again, and then I'm going to go down to 50 on the other side. I'm just going down 50 thousandths below top dead center on either side of TDC. There's 50. And I have about 11 and a half. So now I have 11 and a half degrees on both sides of TDC, so I know that this zero right here, where this pointer is right there, I am at true top dead center. My rod is dead center and set in the center of the piston. Once you get that done, you don't need that indicator anymore. The only reason we put a dial indicator on the piston is to find true TDC. Now what we start doing is we start looking at the cam specs and degreeing the cam. Well, the first spec we want to look at is we want to check the lift of the cam, the lift. Now the lift of the cam is actually how far the valve opens. It's the distance that the valve opens. It's one of the easiest things to check. So that's how far that the lobe pushes that rocker arm from the base circle till it is fully open. We want to know what that distance is and we want to compare that to our cam card. Okay? So let's take a look. Right now we're on the intake valve of number one or the intake logo. We're going to zero this out on the base circle. You know you're on the base, well I'm not on the base circle. <laughs> the way you get on the base circle is you go until that indicator is not moving. Uh, okay, so now I'm rotating, I'm rotating the engine and the indicator is not moving. Rotate the engine until this doesn't move, that means you're on the base circle. 
zero your indicator, you're not on the lobe. Now the engine, the engine rotation is clockwise, so we're going to rotate this engine clockwise until, and your wheel will tell you where your intake is going to open. So right here, my wheel, my intake says it's going to open over here. That means I got to come all the way around before that starts opening. So I'm going to rotate around until my wheel says that my intake is going to open. Okay, I'm getting close now. And now I'm going to check the lift. So there you see it's moving off. It's moving off the base circle. That means that the, the lobe now has begun to push the rocker arm up. This is sitting on the cam lobe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count and compare that to my lift. This indicator is in 1,000 1, thousandths graduation. So one, one complete revolution is 100 thousandths. So there's 100. There's 200. Two, three hundred, three thirty, three forty, three fifty. Okay, three hundred and fifty-four thousandths. Three hundred and fifty-four thousandths. That is the distance that that lifter is going to push that um, push rod and actuate the rocker. Three hundred and fifty-four thousandths. Now. The valve is actually going to open more than that because we have something called rocker arm ratio. The rocker arm is going to multiply the lift of the lobe here. The, uh, the small block Chevrolet from the factory has a 1.5 rocker arm ratio. You can also get 1.6s. We are using 1.5 ratio rockers on this engine. So in order to get the actual valve lift now, we know that our lobe lift here is 354. To get the actual valve lift, you have to take a calculator and you have to multiply the lobe lift by your rocker arm ratio. Okay, so let's do that and we can figure out what our valve lift is. It's not that hard to do, it's simple third grade math. So we get our calculator here, okay, and we're going to clear that and we're going to go. So we got 0 0.354, 354 thousandths of lift. And we're going to multiply that by our rocker ratio. The rocker ratio is the, the ratio of the rocker arm it, that, that it's a fulcrum and it increases the lift. It multiplies the lift. So 354 times 1.5, which is the rockers we're using. We're using 1.5 ratio rockers. And we get 531 lift. Okay. Well, that's pretty close to what the cam card says because the cam card says that the cam has, is 530 lift on the intake. It's 530 lift, so we're within 1,000s. That's really, really close. So that, that, what that tells me is um, that's a good cam lobe. That's a good cam. The cam is matching what the card says. It says we should have 530 thousandths of lift on the intake. Okay? You're going to repeat that for the exhaust, of course, and compare that to the specs as well, but that's how you get your cam lift. Okay, now that we have our cam, our, our lift, we can go on to the next procedure, which is we know we're at maximum lobe lift. In other words, we're at the top of the lobe travel right now. Well, the cam also has a spec called intake lobe center line. Intake lobe center line. Intake lobe center line is where the cam is set, it, set in at, or in other words, the manufacturer says, hey, when we reground this cam, we reground the center line at this many degrees. Okay, So what we're going to do is at maximum lobe lift right here we're going to leave the indicator alone but we're going to zero it. So what we've done is we've gone up to the maximum lobe travel and then we zero out our indicator. Now this process is very similar to the process where we found true TDC except we're not on the piston now we're on the lobe. In order to find intake lobe center line, very simple, you do the same procedure. We're going to take and we're going to go counterclockwise and we're going to go down past 50 thousandths and back to it. So we're coming 50 thousandths off the top of the lobe. Okay? So we're going to go counterclockwise. And we're going to watch our indicator and you can see our indicator is moving there. We're going to go down off the lobe center to 50. We're going to go past it actually. And then we're just going to come right back to 50 in case there's any slack in that chain. 
Uh, we want to get past it. Sometimes this can be a little tricky. You gotta, you gotta use a little finesse here to get. Okay, so we're right on 50 there. Now we're gonna look at our. We're gonna read our degree wheel. Our degree wheel says, and for checking the center line, you're gonna use the white graduations here. So our degree wheel says 60. So you, what you want to do, 60 degrees. What you want to do is you want to write that down. So we're going to take, we're going to get our, our marker here and we're going to write that down. So we have, for our first measurement, 60 degrees. Wrote it down right there, okay? Now we're going to do the same thing we did when we found true TDC. We're going to go back up to the top of the lobe travel, so we're going to go clockwise now. And we're going back up to max lobe lift, which is going to be zero. And now we're going to continue on and we're going to go down the other side of the lobe. And guess how far we're going? You guessed it, 50 thousandths. So we're going to go down the lobe travel on the other side and we're going to go right to 50. And we're going to stop once we get to 50 thousandths right there. And we're also going to read our degree wheel again. Now remember, we're using white numbers for center line. So we have uh, 148. So 148. So we have 60 and 148. 148. So 60 plus 148 uh, gives us 209. So we got 209. Now we're not done yet because our intake lobe center line is not 209. What you have to do is you take that 209 and you got to divide it by 2. So 209 divided by 2 is 104 and a half, um, which is exactly what we're supposed to have. The intake lobe center line is supposed to be at 104 on this engine. So um, we're right on the money. That tells us that the cam is timed correctly. Okay. There's a couple other events that are going to take place as far as duration goes. Um, what duration is, is duration is a, a if, if I'd say, hey, what's the duration of this video today? You'd say, oh, uh, 30 minutes or whatever. Duration is a measurement of time, but we can't use seconds or days or hours or minutes or years to time these events. What we do is we use crankshaft rotation. So duration is literally... From the time this valve opens, we're gonna, we'll go back to the base circle here. From the time this valve opens to the time it closes, how many degrees did this crankshaft rotate? So we're going to get on the base circle, which is where we're at, and we're going to zero this out. We're going to zero it out. I know I'm on the base circle. Now we have to have some type of a reference point. So we can't just start anywhere off the base circle here, you know, because then the wheel's moving and I'm counting degrees. So what we do is we come up off the base circle 50 thousandths, okay? That 50 thousandths is kind of a magical number when you're degreeing. So we're going to go clockwise here, and the intake's going to open pretty quick, and we're going to come right down to 50 thousandths, and we're going to stop. We're going to look at our wheel, and we're going to read it. It says 10 degrees and it's 10 degrees just this side or before top dead center. 10 degrees before top dead center. So we're gonna, we're gonna make a note of that, 10 degrees. Then we're gonna go up to the top of our lobe travel and we're gonna go all the way back down the other side and we're gonna stop at 50 thousandths before the valve opens because I wanna know how many degrees this wheel rotated while this valve was open from 50 to 50. So let's keep going, we'll count. So we're at 50 thousandths now, there's 100, there's 200, there's 354, we know that's our lift. Now we're at the top of the lobe lift, but we gotta go back down the other side and stop at 50 before the valve closes. So we're gonna go, there's 50, there's one, two, and this is three. When I get to zero here, the valve's gonna close, or I'm gonna be off the lobe, so I'm gonna stop at 50. Okay, so what I have is I have 42 degrees, okay? So from 42 degrees all the way through bottom dead center, all the way around the wheel up over to 10 degrees before over here, that's my, that's my uh, duration. So I have 180 degrees plus 10 plus 40. So 180 plus 10 is 190. 
190 plus 42 is 230, uh, 232. 232 degrees of actual duration or duration at 50 thousandths, okay? What's ironic about that is the cam card for this cam says that the intake duration at 50 is 232. And that's exactly what I got. So I know that the cam specs on this camshaft are right. This is the degreeing process. Now I'm going to go through and, and finish degreeing this and make sure that everything's uh, there. There's a couple other specs. There's lobe separation and so forth. But um, I don't really need to walk you through that. The main thing is, is that the duration is right, the lift is right, the intake lobe center line is right. This is a good cam. Now a couple reasons. Number one, you degree the cam to make sure it's timed correctly. And the other reason is you degree the cam to make sure it's not misboxed or defective because it could be the wrong cam. But this one happens to actually match all the specs so far, so this is a good cam. If you skip this step and let's say hypothetically they they misbox the cam. They, they put the wrong cam in the box. You do all this work to research the perfect cam for your build and then what happens is you just stick it in the motor and you don't degree it, right? If somehow they screwed up at the factory and put the wrong cam in or the cam was ground incorrectly, which could happen. I've had it happen before. I've had defective cams right out of the box. You're not going to know any of this until you get this thing in the car and it doesn't work. Or if it does work, it's the wrong cam, it's way too big or too small for your application, or worst case scenario, um, it's, it, it doesn't work with the springs you have and you coil bind your springs and start bending valves and all kinds of stuff like that. So these are chances that you can't take when you're building an engine. There's certain things in life that you can guess at. Uh, building an engine is not one of them you have to know that it's right. And that's why degreeing the camshaft is not optional. You have to set this, make sure the cam is set in right and make sure it's the right cam. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, this is a pretty radical cam, which is kind of what the customer wanted, but it's gonna match good with his RHS heads. We're using a set of uh, 210cc runner RHS heads uh, that got big valves and great flow. So they're, they're gonna be uh, this thing's really going to rip with this cam, uh, this roller cam, and these, this head combination. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, next up, what we're going to do is, is I'm going to, I've got the cylinder heads uh, put together, and we're going to do cylinder. Now that we know that our timing is right, now we can go ahead and do our cylinder head installation. And uh, I guess uh, let's get to it.